Welcome to the Almighty God and Gospel Girl podcast. Each week, you'll hear testimonies that turned failures into hope, despair into inspiration, and darkness into light, as well as actionable tips and strategies that you can implement in your daily life to overcome obstacles that can detour our Christian walk. Galatians 6.2 tells us to carry each other's burdens, and in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. Thanks for spending some time with us today. Now here's your host, the Gospel Girl, Tammy Becker. People in pain want help, whether that pain is emotional or physical scars. Uh, Jesus encountered people in pain all the time, such as the man with leprosy and the sick servant in the centurion uh, in Matthew chapter 18, verses 1 through 13. These people were desperate, and so was an Old Testament character by the name of Naaman. Now, he was in need of healing and he was healed in a rather unusual way that way and that healing changed his life forever this podcast will hopefully remind you that god's ways are not our ways but following them can change one's life forever hi everyone this is tammy becker welcome to the almighty god and gospel girl podcast as i looked through my book of notes i was you know, I read ahead of you all as I prepare for our weekly podcast, and this week's notes are empty. And this is the actual week that my parents' memorial service took place, and I was away from home. And as I looked over the blank pages, they simply say things like celebration of life, travel, and this one very lonely word on the page, pain. How fitting. The Lord always puts us right where he wants us in everything. And that includes me doing his work here on this podcast and what he intends for me to talk about today and pull out of our readings, which is second Kings chapter six to second Kings 25. And that is pain. So let me start out with a story. You know, her name was Dorothy. And during the first, first days of speech class, the teacher was going around the room, having the students introduce themselves. Each student was to respond to the question, what do I like about myself and what don't I like about myself? Nearly hiding at the back of the room was Dorothy. Her long red hair hung around her face, almost obscuring it from view. When it was Dorothy's turn to introduce herself, there was only silence in the room. Thinking perhaps she had not heard the question, the teacher moved his chair over near hers and gently repeated the question. Again, there was only silence. Finally, with a deep sigh, Dorothy sat up in her chair, pulled back her hair, and in the process revealed her face. Covering nearly all of one side of her face, was a large, irregularly shaped birthmark nearly as red as her hair. That, she said, should show you what I don't like about myself. Here was a young lady devastated by her hideous birthmark. She was desperate for a meaningful touch. And when we look to the Bible, so was Naaman. Naaman was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff of his day and the military leader of one of those region's most powerful nations. He was a definite candidate for who's who in the world. He was a cream of the crop. He lived among the upper crust and he caroused among the elite. And the Bible says Naaman, commander of the army for the king of the Aram was a great man in his master's sight and highly regarded because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram and the man was a brave warrior. So did you hear those descriptive words? Don't we all want people to use them, you know, of us? Commander, great, highly regarded, victorious, valiant. Here was a man that had power, position, and prestige. He was successful. He was a winner. He was wealthy. He was a hero. He was respected. 
He was admired. He was envied. But a three-letter conjunction, that small word changes everything. Notice how first one concludes, but he had a skin disease. And you can notice that like in back in 2 Kings chapter 5 verse 1. He could think about all of his accomplishments. He could enjoy his power and his position and prestige. He could admire his home and his wealth, but they all seemed to vanish as he stared into the marriage day. Each time he looked at himself, there was something looking back that defined his life. He was a leper and nothing could change that fact. Consider someone you might know, Christopher Reeve, movie star, wealthy, handsome, winner of awards and honors, respected, loved, and admired by adoring fans. But once he was known as Superman with the power to melt steel, leap tall buildings and fly into the heavens, but now an aluminum wheelchair. He was earthbound and that defined his life. He was a, he was a paraplegic presenting nothing that can change that fact. The fact is Naaman was a leper. Leprosy was the AIDS of Naaman's day. Leper were isolated and humiliated. They were outcasts, the original untouchables. They were forced to wear torn clothing and shout unclean, unclean anytime they encountered like an uninfected person. Leprosy was the most feared disease of the day. It was extremely contagious and in many cases incurable and in its worst form, leprosy led to death. So granted, Naaman's leprosy was probably in its infant stage or a mild form, and he had concealed it, but now his clothing would not cover it up. And while people treated him respectfully, now nobody would touch him. The lack of touch hurt Naaman deeply. So like Naaman and like Dorothy, we too long for a meaningful touch. Why is it that when I'm away from my husband or my children and my parents, I long for their embrace. Why is it that we squeeze the widow's hand at her husband's funeral? Why is it that we sympathetically pat the shoulder of the defeated athlete? Why do we bear a hug, a long lost friend? Why is it that we hold our babies? Why is it that when my daughter is sad, she says, hold me, mommy. Touch brings comfort. Touch conveys acceptance. Touch promotes health. Touch imparts wholeness. Can you imagine stumbling through life without being touched, without someone holding your hand when you're lost, without someone rubbing your back when it's sore, without someone slapping you on the shoulder for a job well done, without being embraced after being gone on a two-week business trip. Naaman did not have to imagine. It was a reality. His leprosy was his birthmark. By the way, what is your hideous birthmark? What is your leprosy? What problem are you trying to conceal? What hurt are you trying to cover up? What prevents you from getting close to other people? Where do you need to be touched? We too, like Naaman and Dorothy, have our disfigurements. We too have become very proficient in covering up our problems. We too need God's healing touch. We too, like the old spiritual sayings, it's not my brother or my sister, but it's me, old oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. So what is the prescriptive cure? We find that in verses 4 to 12. What, what do we do? Where do we find it? Where do we go for healing? In a word, we go down. Why? While down is contrary to the direction we are encouraged, challenged, and even rewarded to go in our world, down 
is the way we must go if we are to find healing. Down is the route we must take if we're going to feel the touch of God. Notice the contrast in Naaman's journey. Naaman, the commander-in-chief, finds direction through a captive servant, his wife's slave. Naaman, the conqueror, finds help in a conquered nation, Israel. Naaman, the highly regarded man, learns of his treatment for a lowly prophet, Elijah. Naaman, the wealthy and valiant servant, is cured in a dirty river, the Jordan. What can we learn from this downward descent? We need people in our lives who look past our hauntingness to see our hurt. Naaman's wife, Naaman's wife's servant, had been taken hostage from an Aramean raid, <clears throat> excuse me, into Israel. Now she served uh, in Naaman's home tending to his wife's every need. And she was not intimidated by Naaman's power, position, or prestige. She saw his pain, called it out by name, and knew of his pain reliever, and told Naaman where he could find help. We need humble people in our lives who look past us, who look past our job titles, our bank accounts, our cars, our houses, and see our loneliness and our need and our hurt. We need people who will touch us at our point of need. We need people who will call our problems like they see it. We need people who see our blind spots. We need people in our lives who love us to not let us make stupid mistakes. Scott Peck in a different drum observes that livid, lived honesty Life in a crisis, difficult, surprising, overwhelming. Yeah, I can attest. One time I was going through a very difficult crisis, and as if there were any any other kind, right? I had about had it with one, with about everything in my life. I was overwhelmed. I felt underloved, pushed to every possible limit I had, and was vulnerable. That's it. A loving friend said I was vulnerable and walked me through what I needed at that moment in love. We need people in our lives who will demonstrate the four C's of loving relationships. Those four things are concern, speak the truth in love to us, commitment, walk through the pain with us, confidently, know the struggles are kept between us and consistently maintain regular contact with us. In practicing these steps, these trusted partners are saying, I believe the best in you and I'm going to help you become the best. These relationships are our balcony people. Everybody has balcony people and basement people in their lives. Basement people drag you down. Yeah, get rid of them. Balcony people lift you up. Who are your balcony people in your life? Who are the people that are pulling you up? Who are the people that believe in the best about you and are helping you become your best? Who are the people that look beyond your outward appearance and see your inward hurt? I have a lot of great friends. And you girls all know who you are. And I thank you for always being there in my life. We need places in our lives that will provide us with safety and security. Israel was a conquered nation. To Naaman, it was a second-rate, third-world country. What did it have to offer? Military, it did not present much of a threat, but spiritually, it provided refuge. So you've seen those homes in your neighborhood that have a poster of a white hand on a red background that is positioned in their front windows. The sign indicates to lost and confused children that this is a safe place if they're in danger, right? And the children know that they can go to the home and hand in the window and they will find a touch of a caring adult that will protect them from harm. We need those places in our life as a child. I had the great outdoors, horses and miles of God's country. Today, 
I have my podcast closet, a small closet, walk-in closet that I can close the door to the outside world and work on my relationship, Bible studies, and work for the Lord in His place. Don't get me wrong. I still like to visit outside of that closet with the Lord, but the closet is my designated to go-to place, my safe place. As a matter of fact, I'm in it right now. The nation of Israel is present throughout the scripture as a metaphor for the church. And the church is a safe place, a place that gives us a caring touch in an uncaring world, a place that provides sanctuary, protection and comfort from those that would see to assault, a place that extends a supportive and oftentimes healing hand to those in trouble. Do you Realize that we have people who come to our churches, to the altars, who do not get touched until they come to church the next week and go to the altar again. Israel was a safe place for Naaman. But before I leave you with this thought, I want you to notice that when Naaman first entered Israel, he was in the right place, but speaking to the wrong person. He first went to the king of Israel. But the king could not help him. In fact, the king misunderstood his coming altogether and thought Naaman was trying to pick a fight. The fact is that many people come to the right place each Sunday, the church, but speak to the wrong person. They come to impress their friends with the money they have, to ask down their uh, classmates and pew pew mates with their clothes that they wear, to amaze their pastors with the credentials they possess, and all while miss the main event. They talk to their friends, to their classmates, even to the pastor. Don't misunderstand. There is nothing wrong with talking with these people. It is right that we do this, right? But if that is all we dialogue with, we have missed talking to the right person. God, in fact, it is becoming increasingly easy in Western Christianity to come to church and not pray a prayer to God or sing a song to God or hear a word from God. Christian worship has given away to religious theatrics. Entertainment has replaced experience. By the way, do you talk to God when you go to church? He is the one who wants to heal you, to touch you, to scoop you in his arms and hug you. We all need prophets in our lives who will point us to the cure. So Naaman goes to Elijah in Samaria and remember Samaria. If Israel were a second rate third world country, Samaria would have been the armpit, the second rate third world country. Samaria was despised even by the Israelites. When Naaman arrives at Elijah's dusty enclave, a far cry from Jerusalem splendor, Elijah sends out his servant. Naaman had been remarkably flexible and amenable, willing to travel out to the prophet's remote outpost to ask for the healing touch. But when Elijah's servant shows up at the door with the instructions for the cure, he is incensed, outraged, ticked off. He not only was sweating bullets from the dirty, dusty desert, he is ready to spit bullets in the direction of Elijah. Prophets have that effect on people. They don't beat around the bushes. They lack tack. They get to the point. They tell it like it is. They often offend and insult, but they speak the truth. And when you're face to face with the disease that is going to take your life and you have got to decide if you want to confront inconvenience or a cure. It's like visiting a gruff doctor who is a specialist for potential deadly disease and no other doctor seems to provide an answer, much less a cure. The doctor long on knowledge, but short on bedside manners, pokes, prods, and, and you know, probes, finally addresses you with, uh, you know, with the tact of a doorknob. And he has a treatment, a cure, and he answers for your condition. And it isn't that that's what, you know, you want is a cure, right? I know when it came to my back surgery, my doctor was matter of fact, no bedside manner, but you know what? He's a genius. He knew what he was doing, and I trusted him, and I appreciated it. And sometimes that's what we have to look at. So Naaman all, almost rejected his opportunity for healing by getting angry that Elijah didn't show up to greet him at the door. Elijah hadn't read 
his Emily Postmanner's book for how to act when foreign dignitaries arrive. He may not have tact, but he had a treatment. He may not have had compassion, but he had a cure. Naaman was part of the pastor's only crowd. Some believe that they cannot be ministered to if the pastor doesn't do the ministering. They can't be prayed for if the pastor doesn't do the praying or preached to if the pastor doesn't do the preaching or visited if the pastor doesn't do the visiting. Naaman was a big shot in his country and he wanted a big shot prophet to meet him at the door and heal him. He wanted this prophet to jump out and shout and dance and put on a big show for his healing to occur. But God does not always send blessings in the people we want and the vehicle we want. Oftentimes, God chooses the lowly person through ordinary means to accomplish his healing. So be careful if you are the big shot only crowd because God might send you a sermon to touch you and heal you and you may miss the blessing if you're looking the wrong way. Many have re received the touch of God in the healing of his power, but because it's not spectacular and have attributed it to coincidence or logic. So we all need a prescription for our lives that will lead to the healing touch. And Elijah's prescription for healing was bizarre. Go wash seven times in the Jordan and your flesh will be restored and you will be clean. Come on now, get real. Let me retrace Commander and Chief Naaman's downward to sin. He receives instructions from a slave girl to go to go and to conquer, forsake Israel, and to a lowly prophet that lives in the armpit of second-rate third world country who gives him instructions to go to the dirty, dingy Jordan River and bathe not once, twice, but seven times. And in case you've forgotten your geography, the Jordan River, which means the descender, flows through a rift valley. It, its headways <clears throat> lies more than a thousand feet above sea level at the Sea of Galilee and its mouth nearly 1,300 feet below sea level at the Dead Sea. So, to go to the Jordan River was to go down, way down. That's crazy thought, Naaman. Seven ducks in a dirty pond. Why? We have rivers in Aram and that are better than the Jordan. Naaman doubted that God's prescription for healing could really do anything. Naaman did not realize that the power was not in the water, but was manifested in the water by doing what God says. Healing always comes from doing what God says. Naaman continued to doubt when he entered the Jordan and came up still a leper. God reminded him that when the Lord says seven six would not do. God is asking some of us to dip seven times. Humility leads us to obedience. The humble person makes no claims on God, but knows that God has claims on him or her. When God asks for seven times, do not try to get by with only five or six. God wants us to go the distance. So will we? God's not trying to tie conditions to his healing, but rather he is testing our obedience. We must believe that God's way is better than our own. We may not always understand his way of working, but by humbly obeying, we will receive his blessing. We must remember that God's ways are best. God wants our obedience more than anything else, and God can use anything to accomplish his purposes. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Why must Naaman and you and I, for that matter, descend downward in order to receive healing? <clears throat> Why must we have a compliant attitude Toward God's instructions. Peter answers that question. And all of you clothe yourself with humility toward one another because God resists the proud, but gives you grace to humble. Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God so that he may exalt you in due time. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 5 to 6. We have to scrape bottom before we can start up. 
we have to look at the death before we can see life. We have to taste pain before we can experience joy. We have to humble ourselves to lowly places and lowly people before we can feel the hand of God lifting us up. As long as God's arm is he chooses to touch us most when we walk humbly before him. Nahum was that low. He finally humbled himself in complete obedience to the loving instruction of God's messenger. And in doing so, was touched by God and healed in a way that did not fix his expectations. So Naaman went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times. According to the command of the man of God, then his skin was restored and became like the skin of a small boy and he was clean. We see that in 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 14. If his leprosy defined his earlier life, it was God's healing touch that redefined his later life. After experienced the grace of God, he was changed, not only physically, but spiritually and vocationally. Naaman stood before Elijah and said, I know there is no God in the whole world except in Israel. Therefore, please accept a gift from your servant. Naaman went from a sick man to a healed man, an ungodly man to a godly man, a lost man to a saved man, a great man to a gracious man, and from a commander of men to a servant. Here it was a man that had felt the touch of God and was changed now and forever. I need that touch. Do you? If we're honest with ourselves, we desperately need the touch of God. Will you and I humble ourselves before God so he can touch us? Will you and I be obedient to his instruction so he can heal us? You know, in closing today, it brings us back to Dorothy, the student in the speech class that showed the others that the one thing she did not like about herself, her large, irregular shaped birthmark that covered nearly all the side of her face, moved with compassion, the godly professor leaned over and gave her a hug. Then he kissed her on the cheek where the birthmark was and said, that's okay, honey, God and I still think you're beautiful. Dorothy cried uncontrollably for almost 20 minutes. Soon other stu students had gathered around her and were offering their comfort as well. When she finally could talk, as she dabbed the tears from her eyes and said to the professor, I wanted so much for someone to hug me and say what you said. Why couldn't my parents do that? My mother won't even touch my face. Dorothy, just like Naaman, had a layer of inner pain trapped beneath the outward scars. She was desperate for a healing touch. Are you desperate? When we get desperate, we will go to whatever lengths necessary to experience the touch and feel of grace, even when God says to humble ourselves by washing in a dirty river. Folks, I hope that you have friends you can turn to. Find those friends in common. Find those friends that can be your comfort, that help you from the pain. I want to dedicate this podcast to my spiritual sisters, to my besties, all of you girls, you know who you are, every single one of you that have gotten me through these dark months of losing my parents and everything else I've been through. This podcast is for you. Thanks for being there and being my healing support. Thank you for bringing me out of the trenches. I love you guys. That's it for today. This is Tammy Becker from the Almighty God and Gospel Girl podcast. I hope that you're back here next week. Don't forget you can you can follow along on the show notes and check out links and graphics on the website at www.youministries.com. God bless you. Have a beautiful week, my friends. See you next time. Bye. Thanks for tuning in to another weekly episode of the Almighty God and Gospel Girl podcast. If you have a testimony you would like to share with us, please contact us through our website at youministries.com. That's y-o-u-ministries.com. Until next week, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace.